Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for this exciting conversation. As you may realize, today is the United Nations International Day of Peace. This important day was started in 1981 by the General Assembly of the United Nations and was voted in as an official day of nonviolence and ceasefire in 2001. Our talk today is a cel in celebration of the International Day of Peace, but it's also a call to action for a more peaceful future. Before I introduce our guests, I wanna start by welcoming you on behalf of the Center for Executive Education at the University of Her Peace, which was also established by the General Assembly of the United Nations. For those of you who aren't familiar with the University for Peace or UPeace as we like to call it, we're an international university located in Costa Rica with the mission to provide humanity with an international institution of higher education for peace with the aim of promoting among all human beings the spirit of understanding, tolerance, and peaceful ex coexistence. As you can tell, that's obviously quite a lofty mission, but it's one we take very seriously. Through all of our master's and doctoral programs, as well as the professional development offerings that we run through the Center for Executive Education, we hold that connection with the United Nations dear. People look to the United Nations for help in resolving the great problems that face humanity and the world. And we at UPeace, embed those United Nations values in all that we do, providing people with the skills, knowledge, and inspiration that they need to start addressing those problems in their own local contexts. So the connection between the University for Peace and the International Day of Peace is quite clear, and we're happy to be hosting this important conversation. Joining me today, we have Gila Clara Quesus, who we know well at the UP Center for Executive Education because she gave a great talk at our 2021 Gross Global Happiness Summit. Gila is a UNESCO Artist for Peace and has her PhD from the University of Boston. Her research on behavioral indicators led her to receive the prestigious Thought Leader of Distinction Award by the Association of Corporate Executive Coaches. Gila is a social entrepreneur and executive coach who uses theatrical techniques and role-playing games as tools to enhance corporate communication and also help those who have suffered trauma in the past. Joining Gila today, we have Professor William Urey, co-founder of Harvard's Program on Negotiations and one of the world's leading experts on the topic. He's a co-founder of the book, Getting to Yes, a 15 million copy bestseller translated into over 35 languages, and is also the author of Getting Past No, The Power of a Positive No, and The Third Side, and most recently, the award-winning book, Getting to Yes with Yourself. This year, William Murray is joining a prestigious group that includes Tara Gandhi and the Dalai Lama in receiving the Nara Humanity Prize for a Better Future in recognition of outstanding individuals who dare to change the world with innovative thinking. They're leaders, negotiators, peacemakers, psychologists, researchers, and more who believe that they can contribute to making this world a better place. Later on, we'll be joined by Julian Pellever for the presentation of this award. So without further ado, please go ahead and put yourself on mute. Um, and we will start with the conversation. Gila, please go ahead. Uh, this is all about uh, William Uri. This is a man who has been dedicated all his life for uh, the benefits of others' uh, life for all the relationship, especially diplomatic, to be better. And for me, having him as a professor was a, a privilege. So it's a big day today for me to have the pleasure to interview him and uh, to share also this uh, important knowledge that he has because he has a lot to talk to us. Uh, Julia, you were kind enough to introduce Julian Pellabert, but Julian Pellabert is very important here today because he's representing uh, NERA Humanity. NERA is the uh, National Institute of Negotiation. He has been working a lot on negotiation, and we have been founding this NERA Humanity uh, together in order to help young people and people who feel helpless to better understand negotiation, of course, based on all the work of William Ori. And that's why today is an important day for me and for Julien as well. So, William, welcome. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time. We know how busy you are. Um, first of all, of course, uh, the first question I would like to ask you is really your definition of peacemaking. We are in a world where today relationship became harder and harder, especially in terms of trust. And what should be 
your definition of peacemaking today? Well, first of all, thank you, Gila, and thank you, Julia, and thank you, Julien, and uh, thank you all, actually. Uh, it's a real pleasure to see all your faces and your names and from all, of, all around the planet. So um, thank you again, and uh, merci. So I guess, Gila, I would say that today, in today's world, as we know, conflict is a, uh, a growth industry. <laughs> You know, everywhere you look, the, you know, domestically in our societies, internationally, globally, every issue from war to climate to hunger, you know, we're faced with conflicts that are seemingly impossible. And to me, what is peacemaking? Peacemaking is, is continuous transformation of those conflicts because these conflicts are, seem impossible. I don't think they are impossible. And when I began working in this area 45 years ago with my colleague, Roger Fisher, you know, we were working on the Cold War and that seemed impossible to people that ever there, there'd be an end to the Cold War. You know, the Berlin Wall was gonna be there forever. And as we know, the Berlin Wall fell, the, that relationship between the United States and the then Soviet Union was transformed. The same was true for South Africa. We were working on South Africa and the problem of apartheid. People said there was gonna be race war in Southern Africa you know, for as long as anybody could envision. And I watched and was there as people like Nelson Mandela, Frederick de Klerk, but just countless individuals working for peace, both in South Africa and around the world helped transform that situation. Same thing in Europe between, you know, in the problem in Northern Ireland, people thought the Catholics and Protestants, they've been fighting each other for centuries. They're going to be fighting each other for centuries. And in each of those cases, the conflict was not ended. Sometimes we have this illusion that peacemaking means ending the conflict, like it, you wrap it up like a present. No, but it, the form changes. It changes from a destructive form to of violence and destructive confrontation and the destruction of value, the destruction of lives for so many into a more constructive creative form. That's to me, the definition of peacemaking. Peacemaking never ends. It's not like, oh, you get to a yes and that's the final yes. What I think of peacemaking being is the impossible yes. The yes that may seem impossible, but is actually a whole series of yeses over time because the game of conflict is not a finite game. It's not a win-lose finite game. It's an infinite game. It goes on. Relationships go on. The United States and Russia still have problems. You know, there are still problems in Northern Ireland. There's still problems in South Africa, but the conflicts that were transformed. And to me, actually, in the world today, as you look around the world today, there's so many injustices. I would argue that, in fact, paradoxically, the world needs more conflict, uh, not less, because we need, we need to, we need to, we, conflict is the way that we deal with injustice. At the same time, we need constructive conflict, creative conflict. And to me, that's what peacemaking is, Gila. Peacemaking is continuous transformation of those conflicts through methods like negotiation. Through methods like negotiation. Um, you were talking in your new way of seeing negotiation of possibilism. And I like this notion also on peacemaking. In fact, when I hear you talking about this notion of unwrapping almost uh, the conflict, trying to have it change of in terms of energy and change of um, burning value, um, it's also a way to change perspective and to realize that in the conflict, there is an interdependency that we cannot um, put away. So could you give us a little, more, a little more information about this notion of possibilism? For sure. Well, you know, for so long, you know, having worked 45 years in some of the worlds, I, I was trained as, as an anthropologist, but I, you know, and I wander around the world in the different war zones and, and, and uh, you know, People would ask me, yeah, but after at the end of 45 years here, are you, are you an optimist still? You know, when you deal with all these impossible situations, are you a pessimist? And I used to say, you know, I'm constitutionally an optimist, of course, but, but I'd like to say now I'm a possibilist. 
And a possibilist is someone who believes in human potential. Of course, there are possibilities that we would kill each other, <laughs> but there's also the possibility we can creatively find ways to deal with even the most intractable, the most impossible situations. And the reason I can say that is I've seen it happen with my own eyes and I've had the privilege of participating in it. I mean, just more recently in the last decade, about 10 years ago, I got a, a call from the president of Colombia who, who wanted to see if, if there any way to put an end, put an end to transform a civil war in Colombia that had been going on for 50 years, ever since the 60s. 50 years of civil war, over 250,000 dead, 8 million victims of the conflict, mostly women, women, children, the innocents. He wanted to know, is there any way to transform this conflict? And he was willing to, to spend his political reputation and capital, because that's the thing. Peace is the hardest work that people can do. People think war is hard. Peace is even harder in the sense of it takes, it takes more of us as human beings. And, and so um, my colleagues and I worked with him for over eight years with the President Santos for, uh, we made 25 different trips down to Colombia. This was even before the process began with the secret process and trying to see whether it could be transformed. And it did get transformed. Is the conflict over in Colombia? No but it's transformed. The, the, the armed conflict came to an end there. And uh, that was, the, that was, that's what's possible, I think, in every conflict facing the world today. That's why I'm a possibilist. And so today, regarding how you change in terms of getting to yes, um, what would be the tendency? I mean, you know, facing the stereotypes that you might think could be the most common, uh, what could be a good way to transform the conflicts in order for people to simply change their mind? What is the shift? What is the paradigm shift that should happen in the mentalities and especially regarding very specific stereotypes? What would be the most common stereotypes you would see today? Well, let me actually just begin by telling you one of my very favorite stories of negotiation, which I think kind of... Um, crystallizes an answer to your question, Gila, which is uh, an ancient story that comes from the Middle East. And maybe some of you may have heard it before, but it's a story of like three sons who receive from their father an inheritance. And uh, they receive an inheritance of 17 camels. And the first son being the oldest, he receives half the camels. The second son receives a third of the camels and the youngest son receives a ninth of the camels. Well, the three sons get into a little bit of a negotiation about dividing up their inheritance, and it's not so easy as it isn't often in negotiation, right? Because 17 doesn't divide by two, and it doesn't divide by three, and it doesn't divide by nine, and each one wants more, and they get into a little bit of an argument, and the argument even risks becoming violent. So finally, in desperation, they go and they consult a wise old woman. And the wise old woman thinks about their problem for a long time. And finally she comes back and says, well, I don't know if I have an answer to your problem, but if you want, I have a camel. Would you like my camel? So the three sons say, well, okay. So then they have 18 camels and then they go to dividing it again. Well, 18 does divide by two. You know, half of 18 is nine. So the first son takes nine. 18 does divide by three. So the second son takes six, which is 18 divided by three. And the youngest son takes his ninth, the ninth of 18 is two. And so if you had nine and six, you get 16 plus two, uh, I mean, you, get, you get 15 plus two, you get 17. They have one camel left over. They don't know what to do with it. So they give it back to the wise old woman. Now, if you think about that problem for a moment, that conflict, I think you'll find it resembles a lot of the negotiations that we get engaged in. At first sight, it seems impossible. What's the secret to that paradigmatic change, Gila, that you're talking about? Is that wise old woman, what does she do? She steps back from the situation for a moment. She goes to what I would call a balcony, which is a, it's like you're in, the, you're in the theater, right? The balcony is the place you overlook the stage. It's a place of perspective. 
It's a place where you can rise above the fray, above the conflict, where you can kind of see the picture more clearly, where you can keep your eyes on the prize. And then what does she do? She comes up with an 18th camel. And what is that? That's building what I would call building the, the parties, a golden bridge, a golden bridge to advance across because there's this big chasm of disagreement. How do we build them a bridge over that chasm? How do we make it as easy as possible for them to say yes? And that's the 18th camel. And then where does that 18th camel come from? It often comes not from the parties themselves, it comes from the surrounding community, which is what I call the third side of any conflict. We often see conflict as two-sided, you know, it's uh, Arabs versus Israelis, it's you know, Catholics versus Protestants. But in fact, there's a third side always, which is that surrounding community, which is the third side, that circle surrounding the conflict. And, and that's in this case, the wise old woman. She's the third party, that's where the third, the 18th camel comes from. So for me, that paradigmatic, paradigmatic shift, if I had to look back over 45 years and say, okay, how do I sum all this up? It's the ability to, in order to get to that impossible yes, we need to step back and go to the balcony in order to be able to see new possibilities. Then we build them a golden bridge in order to create new possibilities, being creative. And finally, we use the third side to act on those new possibilities. That's the paradigmatic shift. It's balcony, bridge, third side. And to make it short, I use, I call it BB3, BB3. And that, that to me is the key to finding those impossible yeses. Uh, and then just, you had a question about stereotypes. Uh, and so what's, you know, as I've wandered around as an anthropologist trying to understand what's behind all these conflicts around the world there, and they're all very different of course, but what's behind them? What's behind almost every one of them is a feeling of scarcity, that there isn't enough, right? And that scarcity, even if you actually scratch behind the scarcity, there's a feeling, a sense that we're all separate. There's no interconnection that you were talking about, Gila. We're all separate, we're separate little parties, and there isn't enough. And therefore, the only way we can satisfy our interests is engage in a win-lose battle. Those are the stereotypes behind conflict, the scarcity, separation, and the win-lose mindset. And what's required for us to make that paradigmatic shift is to realize, in fact, that quite possibly there is no, there's not scarcity. Of course, there's scarcity in one sense, but there may be enough for everyone, just like those camels. We're not separate. We're interconnected. We're, in this case, they're all family, the brothers, right? And in some sense, we're all human family. And what's then required is a mindset to shift from win-lose to not only win-win, which has you know, become a phrase now, which was kind of popularized by getting the yes, but we need a third win. We need a win, not just for both sides of a conflict. We need a win for the whole. We need a win for the community. We need a win for the world. We need a, a win for the world's environment. We need that triple win. That's the new game that we need to learn to play. And this triple win includes the possibility of getting out, the willingness to getting out of the conflicts, is that correct? So it means that the two parties shall not be so in love with their conflicts that uh, they are accepting to take a step back and go to the balcony. Um, when we are talking about stereotypes such as gender stereotypes, which what happened in Afghanistan, for example, um, in the negotiation, shall it be a question that would be close to men and, and change in paradigmatic um, approach to women, for example? Is it something that you could um, you know, advise? What, what could be something that could be a help in terms of um, this mental switch that is supposed? Well, it's really hard to generalize about gender, but I would say, at least in my experience, and there's some scientific research to back this up, um, men tend to be more, they, they get more sucked into that win-lose, who's gonna win this one in the short term, right? Women, I think evolutionarily are trained to pay a little more attention to relationships and long-term. And so, 
I've found that, you know, the more women are involved and certainly the feminine, whether it's women themselves in, 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 a, in, a, in a negotiation, you know, there's more tendency, there's more tending to those relationships, which are so key. Um, men, you know, often uh, uh, make the mistake, I would say, in negotiation of, you know, you've got to be hard on the problem, you know, and really solve that problem. So that means being hard on the person, hard on the people. Okay, well, that's, that's what's possible. Women sometimes make the opposite mistake, which is, uh, you know, we want to be soft on the persons. We've got to tend to the relationship. So we're soft on the problem and we, you know, we give in too easily. And the successful negotiator, in my experience, is soft on the people, respectful to the people, and hard on the problem, on the really trying to solve the problem in a way that, 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 that works for everyone. So, uh, so I think we need both the masculine and the feminine, and we need, and certainly in the peacemaking field, we need a lot more women in the leadership of women. So, and I think that's starting to happen, and it's really uh, uh, an extremely promising trend. Well, Soro, so your career, have you seen an evolution of ego in front of negotiation? Do you, would you say that the ego of the countries have changed now that they know all the protocols that you have been, uh, and together with Roger Fisher, given to the world? So do you see, I would say, an ego education thanks to the trainings of some countries, for example? Would you say that some, some countries understood uh, the mutual gain and, and got softer in some relationship? I would say that's what happens in conflict is people start to, I've noticed this in, in conflict is people, you know, especially the men, you know, the, there's, a, there's a, uh, a, a syndrome I call the me syndrome, which stands for male ego syndrome, right? <laughs> you know, you know, we, you know, they butt heads. And then there is something that happens in these peacemaking processes where, where suddenly the ego starts to diminish. People start to realize that there's things at stake, like the future, their children. You know, I was just, uh, I don't know why, I was just remembering back to Northern Ireland, um, you know, that the head, the reputed head of the IRA was, was a man by the name of Martin McGuinness. And, uh, and this was back in the 80s or 90s. Yeah, probably the 80s, actually. Yeah, uh, back in the 80s, early 90s, maybe. Um, he, the IR had declared a ceasefire and then had broken the ceasefire and the, the terrorist acts were going on. And he was confronted at home by, going back to the role of women here, by his wife and by his daughter over the dinner table and said, you told us you were going to stop. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's to me, that's the third side, you know, that's the third side, that's the community. And that's when ego starts to, <laughs> especially the male ego in this particular case, starts to, uh, uh, oh, okay. And, uh, and Martin McGuinness made the most remarkable turnaround where he led the IRA together with Jerry Adams, into an agreement, uh, you know, the Good Friday Agreement. But he later served in government. He became the Minister of Education. And his colleague, the one he worked most closely with, was his most bitter adversary on the Protestant side, Loyalist side, who was a minister who you may remember by the name of Ian Paisley. And the two of them, who had been these radical firebrands, actually formed a friendship. And that's where the ego starts to diminish. And and a lot of it was through the role of women. In business relationship, it's also the same thing. You know, I've been working with lots of uh, businesses in negotiation. And sometimes in terms of salary negotiation, bosses forgot that even if they don't have some money to give, they forget that, in fact, what the person wants to take back home, it's not only money. It's also a little bit of something to answer this third party whether it's a wife, whether it's a part significant other, whether just to say, yes, I got something, you know, I've been working so hard and you know what, I 
got the guts to ask for a salary and guess what I got something so just a little bit of something and sometime you know a hierarchy would forget that there is this conversation that will happen right after the negotiation and if they don't give anything this is a disaster for the relationship and of course they're losing the employee would you say that this could be also an illustration of this third party absolutely no no question about it in fact you know one of the most useful exercises i find to use in when you're preparing for a negotiation is to imagine the other side, maybe the employee, accepting your proposal and then having to go to the people that they care about, it might be their family, for example, as you were saying, and explain why this was a victory. In other words, sit down, take out a piece of paper, write out in advance the other side's victory speech. What are they going to say to their constituency, the people they care most about, about why accepting your proposal is a victory for them? And then work backwards from that. How do you help them deliver that victory speech? Excellent. In terms of role games, it is true that it helps uh, for this uh, paradigmatal shift uh, to get um, the other better prepared to this positive no, the way you call it. Excellent. Uh, we are International Day of Peace. And so I would like to ask you also this question. Do we learn? Do nations learn from countries, uh, from conflict? Can we say that the, the harm, the difficulties, the aggressivity, the violence is something that served the world to get better? Well, paradoxically, uh, you know, human beings, I find, unfortunately, when we're offered a choice between learning the easy way by like learning or we learn the hard way, we often choose the hard way, right? And we learn, we learn, uh, sometimes we learn through the destructiveness of conflicts that, you know, just like people learned, there was World War I in Europe, which was, you know, the great, great war, and there wasn't enough learning, then there was World War II, and then that's how the UN got born, right? The League of Nations got born out of World War I, and that wasn't quite enough, but, and, you know, slowly, slowly, the world is making progress. I mean, it may not seem this way from looking at the news, but actually the numbers of wars, the numbers of people killed in wars has been gradually going down for the last 50 years. Um, there's been some upticks a little here and there, you know, uh, you know, which are very serious, but there has been a slow learning process. I mean, you used to be that war, you know, a century ago was glorious. You know, when people, uh, you know, in Paris there, when, when in 1914, in August, you know, all the women and the other came out and wished them, oh, it was going to be a glorious success and the, all the soldiers were sent off. You know, since then, there's been a lot of learning that war is a terrible thing. No one wins in war. No one wins in war. And uh, in the end, everyone loses. And, you know, even in the most powerful country in the world, like the United States, for example, with all its power in Afghanistan against a very small force, comparatively small force of the Taliban, was not able to win, had to leave. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just an example, one more example that war does not work. That's why we need negotiation. Well, you mentioned BB3 and I know, and I would like to say hello to two of your most precious collaborators, uh, Hildi Kane, who is your assistant, and David Landers. I know that they are here and I'm saying hello to them. But, um, so would it, would it be an advice that you give to any of us to make more peace, um, to make peace with ourselves, with, uh, in our relationship with the others? Would BB3 would be the magic formula? Or do you have any other advice you could give us? Well... Uh, yes, uh, I would, first of all, I would, I would say, I mean, in the last 45 years, you know, I started off, you know, like, you know, getting, getting, yes, actually it's anniversary of its publication. It's 40th anniversary is, is actually this week. So this Happy is, Happy birthday. <laughs> this is a celebration here, uh, of, you know, 40 years and getting yes was focused on how to influence the other, right? How do, you, how do you influence the other most effectively? And probably the lesson, if there's one lesson that I've learned most in the last 40 years, is that if we want to be able to influence the other, we need to learn how to influence ourselves first. 
that we, do, you know, it, you know, <laughs> we, we keep on thinking we want to change the other side's mind, but in fact, it starts right here. The single biggest obstacle for me in my personal life or in my thing, to me, getting what I need, satisfying my interests, is not that difficult person on the other side of the table. It's not that difficult person in life, as difficult as that person might be. It's right here. I'm the most difficult person. The most difficult person is the person you look at in the mirror every single morning. And if we can learn to, that's a lot of what's going to the balconies about. If we can learn, you know, there's a, a saying uh, that when you are angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. And I think that's very true. You know, human beings, we naturally, you know, we get frustrated, we get angry, but then we say things that we come later to regret. And that happens a lot in conflict. You know, uh, Gandhi noticed this. He said, uh, you know, an eye for an eye. And what happens? We all go blind. You know, so, so the ability not to react. You know, neuroscientists tell us, you know, it takes about 90 seconds for any emotion like anger or fear or whatever to go through your system. If you can learn to pause, just introduce pause, a little bit of silence. You know, there's even uh, an interesting study done by one of my colleagues at MIT on negotiation where they studied different negotiation groups and all they did was they measured the number of pauses in the conversation, that was it. And there was a direct correlation between the number of pauses and how collaborative the process was and how successful the outcome was. So just slowing down, you know, you want to go fast. We live in a very fast world. We need to go slow. We need to pause. We need to go to the balcony. Just we need to take some time for ourselves. We live in a very fast world. The Internet's very fast. You know, with email, for example, you know, you get an email or you get a text that you that makes you irritated from a colleague or from someone or whatever. And, you know, the, 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 the temptation to hit the reply button and get it out of your system. And then you hit reply all, and then the whole thing escalates, right? You know, there's a balcony button on that screen, which is, which we never use, but it's like save as draft, you know, write it out, save it as a draft, then go to the balcony, meditate, go for a walk, have coffee with a friend, do something, sleep on it, go back and look at that message, you're going to hit delete. <laughs> and then you're going to pick up the phone and you're going to try and talk with that person with, with voice or in person even better, but to try to, to listen to that person, because that's the key in negotiation. As we think of negotiation as talking, but successful negotiation is much more about listening. So learning to pause, learning to listen effectively, not just listen from your perspective. The hard thing is to listen from the other side's perspective, to put yourself in their shoes, in their frame of reference. We can learn to do that, then I think that's the success. That's the secret to successful negotiation. So one of my last questions of the day before having yeah, Julien coming and, and us giving you this uh, beautiful uh, prize that we'd like to offer you. Uh, what could you tell us, could you share with us, what's your balcony, William? What is your way to find peace? Uh, and you have this type, you know, of uh, peacemaking things with yourself. Well, Gila, it's a good question. You know, when I was a boy, um, Uh, when I was six, I moved from the United States to Switzerland, to the Swiss Alps for a year. And I fell in love with the mountains. And for me, that's where I, I, I live right now in Colorado. I live in the mountains, which is like Switzerland <laughs> in the U.S. And, uh, and for me, the mountains are my personal balcony. You know, I, I travel around the world. I go to Afghanistan. I go to the Middle East. You know, I go to Korea. But I come back here to the mountains and the mountains, they've always been here. You know, they're always here. They've been here for millions, tens of millions of years. You get perspective. For me, I, like going for a walk in the mountains every day, if I can, is my way of regenerating myself in, in this world of, of conflict. So that's, that's my personal balcony is taking a walk. Nature, beauty, you know, there's nothing like beauty. I see some beautiful flowers behind you you know, to give you a little bit of hope because there's so many problems. It's so easy to fall in despair and beauty awakens the heart again, brings a sense of wonder. And then you, 
gives you the strength to go back into the fray, fight the good fight, transform conflicts, because it's never ending. This game never ends. This is a game that never ends, but it's a game in which everyone can benefit, as opposed to the usual games, which are great for sports, where you know someone wins and everyone else loses. This is a game where, where we all benefit. Everyone benefits, not just us, but our children, our grandchildren, and, and successive generations. Thank you for sharing this. And uh, this is uh, our sponsor, Heartfulness, who will also be very moved by what you're saying because of the power of meditation. And I'm saying hello to all the people coming from the Heartfulness. Julien, I will let you describe a little bit uh, of the piece and having you, uh, you know, coming on stage, please. Julien Pellaber, the CEO of NERA Institute. I'm really glad to be with all of you and to be with you, Wiami. It's really an honor to to be present for this evening and uh, we would like to to give you the 2021 united nations and nera humanity prize for a better future uh, in recognition of your effort to promote innovative thinking to change the world uh, for a better future and for all what you did uh, in your life to uh, to help us to better understand what is negotiation and how we can live all together uh, for a better life and a better future. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, William, for all your work. It's really inspiring us to be a better version of ourselves. Thank you. Merci, yes. Julien. Thank you. Yes, uh, at NERA Institute, we are trying to find, I would say, the future of negotiation. So, of course, we are extremely uh, scrupulous regarding how well things are followed in terms of uh, the BATNA. We have to share what is the BATNA with our audience, which is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, which is the plan B. Um, saying that in front of the master of the bad night is very <laughs> strange, but that's great. And so we are really trying to bring that to the world also. And so NERA is really something that is trying to help with, uh, I would say, getting the negotiation more popular, especially in uh, countries that are in difficulty. So that's why it was very important for us to have uh, this prize given uh, given to you. Um, so, Julia, maybe you wanted to ask uh, some questions to William. That could be uh, important for uh, our NERA humanity. Uh, yeah, I really love what you say about the, the fact to look for a, a third win and how negotiation is not like a sport with a, a loser and a winner. Can you give us more clue to understand what is winning in negotiation, please? Yeah. Thank you, Julien. <laughs> uh, winning in negotiation to me is satisfying your interests. It's, and your interests are your deep desires, your aspirations, dealing with your concerns, with your fears. Um, and, and in the end, it's basic needs. Every one of us, every human being has a basic need for well-being, you know, for to put food on the table, put food on the table for your family and so on, for, for security and safety, right? For some kind of recognition of yourself, for some sense of autonomy, um, for dignity, right? And so to me, that's success. Success is when there's dignity for everyone, there's a well being for everyone, there's safety, a sense of safety for everyone. Then that's, that's the goal of negotiation is to meet the basic needs. You may not always get everything that you want, that you say you want, your positions, you know, the things you say we want. I want this sum of money, I want that territory. But it's the basic needs that are met. And let me just give you one example. About uh, two decades ago, I was involved in mediating with a, a Swiss institution, um, a conflict in Indonesia, a civil war that had been going on for many years, 50 years in, in, in Indonesia, over the province of Aceh. Um, and I was sitting with in Geneva with, with the leaders of the Free Aceh Movement, the GAM, and I said, 
you've been fighting. What do you want? What's the purpose? You get your question, you know, what's the purpose of the negotiation? You've been fighting for 30 years for independence. You know, what do you want? We want independence. We want independence. We want independence. That's what we want. Okay. I got it. Why do you want independence? I mean, why do you want independence? What, what's independence going to give you? You know, they've been fighting for years. There were thousands dead for independence. But I can tell you around that table in, in Geneva, there was silence. They didn't quite know how to answer that question. They knew what their position was, independence. But they hadn't quite thought through what they really wanted the independence for. I said, because is it economics? You want control over your natural resources? You know, there's, you know, all that all, all, all offshore resources that are there. Is it political? You want your seat at the United Nations? You know, is it symbolic? Is it, um, is it you want, you know, autonomy? You know, like the culture, your culture and that your children can go to school in your own language. What does independence mean to you? And then, because the thing is, the truth is, is that they said, they realized that militarily, they were never going to be stronger than the Indonesian army. They weren't going to defeat the Indonesian army. So the question was, could they meet those other interests, those interests of why they were fighting without necessarily getting independence? And they could still keep the dream of independence. And, you know, five years later, they reached an agreement which gave them full autonomy, political autonomy. The people who were the leaders of GAM became the the, the governor and the vice governor of the province, you know, the, the, in the parliament of the province, they, their own language was respected. They got control over their natural resources. Did they get independence? But no, their basic needs were, were beginning to address and the basic needs of the people were, were, were addressed. And that's really the purpose of negotiation. This notion of meaning is extremely important. Um, do you think that, and that's going to be our final question, do you think that this willingness of uh, meaning is also something that we have to look for in a world of COVID? Uh, we know that it's going to be a spiral. We know that we're going to have a lot of variants and uh, things will be also complicated regarding everything we'll have to do regarding what you were saying was extremely important in the pyramid of uh, Maslow, the security and regarding for us, for our children and children of children. So would you say that this notion of meaning is the most important to keep, no matter which conflict we're going through or negotiation we're trying to do? There is a basic human need for meaning. People want their lives to be meaningful. And that's, to me, one of the great opportunities with peacemaking is to redefine, it used to be that war gave people's lives meaning. Can peace give people's lives meaning? Can peace give people's lives even more meaning? And we can. And that's why the peacemaking profession, the negotiation profession, to me, you know, Einstein put it well after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He said, there's a race going, that's now started between the human being's technological genius to devise weapons of incredible destructiveness that can put an end to all of life on earth and our moral, emotional, political, social capacities, our genius to find ways to live together and create meaning together, right? And create meaning and, and create meaning. That's to me is the great challenge that we face today. And, and that's that's the ongoing challenge is, is, is how do we make peace genuinely meaningful and not just some kind of abstract thing. And to me, what that is, it goes back to your first question, Gila. It's in the game of the impossible. Yes. The game of, you know, what if, for example, let me just give you a dream here. What if there was, you know, in addition to the Olympic games, we had the peace games, right? Which were, which were, there were teams organized around the world tackling the world's toughest conflicts, right? Not competing with each other, but competing against the problem, against the challenge of these impossible conflicts. A league, you know, a league like, like the League of Nations, call it a league of possibilists, of teams all playing, working with each other. And I think we could do it. I really think we can transform these impossible conflicts. And that's what the world needs is these peace games. There are war games, we need peace games. 
Because I games, know. people love, bring meaning to people. People love to play games. And uh, as you know, and so may, may we all become possibilists and join, form this league of possibilists. Amen, really. Um, you write uh, by saying also this notion of playfulness needs to be here because even if people want meaning, they don't want to have sad meaning. They want to have joyful meanings. They want to have energetical meaning. They want to have dynamism, the willingness to just live. And live is also a way not only to make efforts, but progresses with flourishing people, you know, getting to, yes, with happiness. And this is something that we'll see uh, in the next um, conversation with Tal Ben Shahar. Uh, William, I want to thank you so very much for those very, very precious moments that we spent together. Has been a great pleasure to have you as a speaker. Um, Julien and I were very honored that you accepted this prize. And uh, we would like to thank, of course, our great host, uh, which is the Center for Executive Education at University of Peace. Um, we would like to quote Mohit Mukherjee and Julia Delafield, who is the director who hosted us so nicely. We would like to thank our sponsor. We'd like to, of course, mention Heartfulness and their event Connecting for Peace, together with Mera and uh, UNESCO Artists for Peace, uh, representing by the work that I'm doing regarding the way of bringing peace through art and culture, which is also something very important. Uh, and that negotiation is also a way to illustrate since negotiation is, of course, an art. So thank you. Thank you for talking to us so sincerely, coming from the heart. We wish you all the very best. What could we wish you to help you continue in this wonderful direction that you're having? You can join me in forming this league of possibilists and let's play these peace games and let's take tackle these world's problems. And so uh, that would be give me joy to welcome you all into this league. Definitely, you heard Professor William Uri, we all invited to this possibilism uh, movement that he's creating for more peace in the world to create those Olympics, Olympics. You know what I mean. So please join him. Thank you again, William, for accepting our invitation. I wish you a wonderful evening. And of course, I see you in an hour to welcome Tal Ben Shahar on this notion of happiness together with Ernie Ross, who is here and I'm saying hello to, uh, discussing how psychology, positive psychology together with peace is also a way uh, to be possible today. Thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you all. Un grand plaisir. Merci. Merci. Bye bye. Infiniment.